Hi, Elwood City Limits listeners. This is Will. And, uh, yeah, it's starting off a little bit uh, differently, this episode of Elwood City Limits, than normal. But don't worry, we will be getting back to a little bit more of uh, what normal is around here. Uh, well, yeah, we this week, as it happened, our schedules, my schedule, and the schedule of one Lucas Mancini, um, well, we're a bit strapped for time. It's a busy week, so I wanted to take this opportunity to do a couple of things uh, while I have the time. And Lucas and I will be getting into the episode in just a few minutes. But I didn't want to neglect this part uh, or uh, skip it entirely. That being the emails and the acknowledgments. So, uh, yeah. So, I will be reading those off myself so that they are guaranteed to get attended to. And that way, we can have kind of the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, Lucas uh, won't be here with me for the emails, but that's okay. We do have a couple of them, and I wanted to make sure that they got read. So let's go to them, first of all. Uh, ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com is, of course, the email address where you can send all of these correspondences, such as from Michelle. Hey, Will and Lucas, hope you're both having a good summer. Since I've had a lot of time on my hands lately, I've been taking the time to read some of the classics that I either never read before or read as a child and have since wanted to reread. Last week I was reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and my Arthur radar went off. There's a line in the book that says, They very soon came upon a griffin. In Season 1, Episode 17, Meek for a Week, the line is spoken by Mr. Ratburn in the classroom. I immediately read it in Mr. Ratburn's voice and heard the echo, and then thought of Francine's head popping off and landing in someone's yard, saying, My, but it's a lovely day. Uh, I never knew that it was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland that they were reading in this episode, but it gave me a laugh. If I happen to come across any more reverse Arthur references in any other classic books, I'll let you know. Thanks, Michelle. I'm glad that you found out about that one. Uh, We have a short one here from Viv, uh, who is talking about when they were six years old in the first grade, my teacher told my class the original version of the Cinderella story, where the stepmother does something very disturbing to her daughters in order to make the glass slipper fit on their feet. It was very messed up for my teacher to tell the original version of that story to my class and I at that age. But from what I can remember, it didn't give me any nightmares or haunt me in any way. I think I just thought the stepmother was crazy and evil. Even though it didn't affect me that much back then, I was still six years old. How old were you guys when you heard that version of Cinderella? Um, a bit older than six, I want to say. But I did own, uh, me personally, I did own a set of fairy tales that were like the classics uh, th- that didn't sugarcoat the ending. So I knew from a relatively early age that, you know, the ending of the Little Mermaid fairy tale... Uh, has to do with the uh, the I guess the air the character who would become Ariel, uh, like dying, like straight up. So yeah, I think with fairy tales, at least at a small age, you can kind of separate what's being done, or at least some kids can. So I actually not don't know when I I did know that about Cinderella, but I couldn't tell you exactly when I found it out. So thanks for that little detail there, Viv. Next, we got one from Pretty Cool Stairs. Hey, ECL. First of all, I, too, had a childhood of enjoying butter sandwiches. My grandma would bake homemade bread, and we would devour it with margarine. I remember being more of a snack than an actual meal. Love this ongoing butter sandwiches dialogue. You had mentioned something about Grandpa Dave's appearances on the show, and unfortunately, after Happy Anniversary, I'm pretty sure he only has one more role in the entire series? This has always been surprising to me, since Dave is featured in the opening theme song along with the rest of the family, and he began in Season 1 having a few fairly important roles. I've always wondered why Dave never caught on like Thora did, if it was intentional at all, or if it just naturally came about that Thora would assume more of the grandparent role in the show. I know Thora is based on Mark Brown's own grandmother, so maybe that offers some explanation. Now, that's something I'd really like to ask if we ever do get a coveted Mark Brown uh, interview. That would be something I'd like to ask. Or one of the or um, one of the showrunners or one of the longtime writers of the show. Why did Grandpa Dave stop being used? That's too bad. I really liked him as a character. I got to tour my local PBS station about 15 years ago with my family, and at the time, one of the employees mentioned that Antiques Roadshow was PBS's most successful ratings hit. My mom even scored an Antique Roadshow season poster. Uh, 
I've always considered it an old person's show, too. But I did watch it occasionally with my mom, who's really into antiques and things of that sort. It's certainly not the price is right, as it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but Antiques Roadshow is a fun, laid-back show that you can play along with and guess the appraisals. It's full of history and cultural references, too. It's a WGBH production, so it's surprising they renamed it Treasure Caravan for the Arthur world. Oh, thanks, Pretty Cool Stairs. Uh, this one is from Sal. Hey, Will and Lucas, love this podcast and the weekly rush of nostalgia. Uh, something I've always loved about the early Arthur seasons is the music that sometimes plays during montages, interludes for scenes, etc. One of my favorites is the sad piano that plays when Buster is leaving, or someone is sad, and the music that plays when the Tibbles are telling the truth to everyone and hurting everyone's feelings. Yeah, like the... Do, 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 do. I know exactly what you mean, Sal. Was just wondering if you both had any opinions or thoughts on the background music soundtrack of Arthur and the jazz country fusion that it prescribes to, or even a favorite piece. Uh, Sal, great question. Um, well, there's a few that we use. I mean, if you if you listen to the kind of uh, the midpoints of ECL episodes, you'll recognize one or two of them. Um as for favorites, oh man, um, I'll have to. I mean, I, I always say I'll have to think about it because I'm terrible at being put on the spot. But there's like the that that's particularly memorable to me. That one's got a little bit of a uh, a lunatic flair to it that I really like. Um, yeah, Arthur music I just find very charming, and uh, I'm glad that somebody else noticed. So Sal, thank you for that. Quick, uh, quick one here from Kelsey. Uh, happy early birthday to Will. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's August the 29th, in case anybody's curious. Uh, Arthur Holden's birthday is also August the 29th. No kidding. Oh, that's awesome. We're going to have to say a happy birthday to Mr. Arthur Holden on our Twitter uh, on August 29th, Saturday. And Barack Obama's birthday, August 4th as well. You know who else was born on August the 29th? Uh, the King of Pop himself, Michael Jackson, which is uh, eh, eh, maybe not as great uh, a, a, bra- a bragging line as it used to be. Let's end it off uh, from Lion Dog ZXA, who says, Dear Lil and Wukas, it has occurred to me that I've never emailed my feelings on when Carl met George. Well, better late than never, my friend. It's about time I changed that. I first saw that episode around the time I was diagnosed with autism, so I understood Carl's behavior. Similar to him, I hyperfixate on certain topics and interests like he does with trains. I can also relate to his fondness for blue, since it's my go-to color for products. Many of my favorite characters are blue. Sonic, Mega Man, Captain America, Perry the Platypus. Just like Carl in the episode... I experience sensory overload and choose either running from the issue or fighting through it. I appreciate Arthur's attention to detail that makes this easily the best representation of autism on television. Well, thank you, Lion Dog. Let's keep going. On the subject of D.W. Ames High and Flaw and Order, our episodes today, I have fond memories of watching these episodes all the time when I was a kid, and I never understood the format of Flaw and Order until I realized later on it was a Law & Order parody. So if Arthur could parody a show, what show would it be? I'd like to see a Stranger Things parody, where DW gets kidnapped by a creature in the woods, and it's up to Arthur and his friends to save her. Or less likely, a Detective Conan parody, where Arthur uses Holmes-like intellect to solve a murder. Oh, jeez, murder. I don't know. Uh, oh, so good one, Lion Dog ZXA. Uh... Jeez, Stranger Things is such a good such a good shout, and I wish I'd thought of it myself. But you beat me to the punch. Um, let's say, you know, kind of surprised they never did a full-on, like, Pokemon parody. They, you know, they had uh, Dopeymon. But they never really touched it beyond that. I kind of thought maybe maybe they would. And you know something? Have they done, like, a Star Wars parody? I mean, ugh, for me, Star Wars is super played out. But, I mean, if they haven't done it yet, maybe they should. Star Trek, another one that I could see. Um... I would I would love I would straight up love an episode where it's like Arthur is Holmes and Buster is Watson and but, but I've, of course I feel that that's a bit of a disservice to Fern who my goodness she talks about Sherlock Holmes all the time in this episode so I think that she should get first dibs on that. Um, I might put that one to Lucas as well once we get this episode rolling. So thanks, everybody, for your emails. Again, that's elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Uh, again, we just we only have time f- to record the episode itself this week, the, the talking about the Arthur episode. But I also wanted to acknowledge the fact that we have got uh, even more 
patrons this uh, this past couple of weeks. And I want to say a big heartfelt thank you to everybody who's signing on for For the Kids and other exclusive content. Now, we're going to be talking about what's coming up on For the Kids uh, next time very soon. And maybe that will encourage you to join us at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits, just like... Uh, there are our newest patrons, such as Valeria, Hannah Lee, Lawrence Lai, Daniel Uptograph, Joe Low Flo, Ursula Cat, Michelle. Oh, Michelle, I think this is you who sent the email. Michelle Sprzinski, uh, Owen, Lee Goldson, Teresa, Lion Dog ZXA, EJ Acra, Christine Lescody, Greg Hagai, Yoshi, Lily W, Melissa Avales. Josias Melendez, Andrew Power, Shelby Eden Dawkins Law, Matt, Pretty Cool Stairs, Marlo Stanfield, Rachel Pearson, Michaela Gibson, Kristen, Sierra S, Kat, Aaron DeFilippo, William, Shayna Bennett, Caitlin Harrington, Kaylin Krogall, Kevin Noon, Jake Bailey, Macy Ball, Riley Stevens, Joe Sue, Christine Wong, Stella, Froppy, Emily K, Shander LaFave Boten, John Griswold, Dan Mike Dawson Silva, Light Relentless, Ian Collis, Leanne S., and John DeLong. Thank you very much, everybody. I think it's also worth noting that we have a new goal over on our Patreon, which you all are helping us to move towards. And that new goal is that once we hit 60 patrons, you know, that'll probably be around $60 a month that we would be making, or or some such. I actually forget the number in in money, but basically 60 patrons is the goal. And by that point, I will be able to justify a purchase of Adobe Audition, which will hopefully make the show sound even better. So that is our next goal that we are working towards. It's a technical goal for the show. Uh, but so far, we are so appreciative of everybody. And we are also appreciative of all of you who either, uh, if you don't want to commit to uh, pat- Patreon, that's okay. Um, if you're not interested in the in the rewards or anything like that, if <laughs> all this to say, <laughs> um, if you're not on the Patreon, we appreciate you all the same. You don't have to pay any money for this show, but we really appreciate those who do because, well, it means that it's just a little reminder that. Yeah, there are people listening, but other great reminders exist, like all of our Twitter followers, all of our likes on Facebook, all of our emails that we get and the interactions with the show. So whether you're on Patreon or not, we really appreciate the fact that you listen, and we want to make sure to let you know that uh, as often as we can without getting uh, too annoying about it. All right, well, that's our emails. Those are our acknowledgments. Uh, So we're going to take a quick little... uh, uh, it feels weird to begin the show with the theme and then not have uh, me and Lucas start it, so I'm probably just going to rewind it back. And uh, yeah, once we uh, return here, Lucas and I are going to get into this week's episode of Arthur. So please join us, uh, and I guess you can do that by continuing to listen. So let's uh, let's rewind back the theme song here. <laughs> Well, it's not quite uh, fishing the shores of PEI, but Lucas, uh, this episode of Arthur will have to do. That's right, I'm off the boat from the island. Made use of the uh, Atlantic bubble, Will. For Mm. our American listeners, um, we have uh, Atlantic provinces on the east coast of Canada that are allowed to visit one another, but we're not allowed to visit any of the other provinces in Canada without self-quarantining for 14 days. This is, of course, exempt from the Atlantic provinces, and I made full use of it by traveling to the land of Green Gables, the birthplace of Confederation, Prince Edward Island. It looked like a pretty righteous vacation. You looked like you had a lot of fun. I was I was on the boat. I caught a mackerel. I don't. What does he say in Animal Crossing? I don't remember what he says in Animal Crossing. More, anybody, more like he always says a pun. More like a C plus. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, no, I, I, I had a delightful time. How about yourself, Will? How did the long natal day weekend treat you? Pretty well. I'm trying to remember what I did. I, uh, my wife and I bottled a bunch of wine, so maybe that's why I'm having trouble remembering. Ooh, I saw that on Twitter. You're, you're becoming a vintner. Something like that. I mean, it's really all it is is just picking out a type of wine, and we just have a bunch of bottles. We've been actually doing this for years, but it's just like 
it, we haven't been able to do it in a while because it's like, well, you got to put down like a hundred bucks or something, but you get thirty bottles of wine. So fi- I mean, finally had the spare money. Hundred bucks for thirty bottles of wine is pretty good. Yeah, something something to that effect. So yeah, we did. We had the money, and we're just like, yeah, let's do it. So we we did, and we won't have to think have to think about buying booze for a little while. And then we spent some time. What are you like a Merlot guy? Uh, I am whatever my wife likes to drink. I'm very not seven ale. Like, I'm very not picky about uh, wine, and she is. It has to be red. It's uh, red or dead. So there you go. Oh, well, I agree with her on that one. I, I'm not, you know, not to dis- besmirch white wine, not to yuck anybody's you yum, but I too, you know, I mean, will Lucas Mancini, the Gabagool. I'm Italian. Got to be having the red wine. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely, uh, I, I'm a I'm a fan of white wine. I like them all. I, I again, really not picky. As long as it can get me where I want to go, I uh, I will gladly uh, take the ticket, ride the ride. Uh, so it's yeah, just like the public bus. <laughs> Lucas, it's it's good to have you back uh, in one piece. Having having fished and gotten, it seems like for this vacation you were aiming high, just like DW was is aiming high in this episode we're talking about here. That's right. That's right. Uh, maybe you know. In this case, high being um, sea level. Uh, in DW's case, high being uh, you know Mars, outer space. Yes. Uh, yeah. So this is one that we are going to be talking about today. Uh, DW Ames High actually starts in a museum with Arthur. He's uh, talking about the life of Albert Einstein. Who I'm... I had always heard, Will, that Albert Einstein couldn't speak until he was four. This was like. A, a, a thing that's been repeated and now I don't know if this is like an old wives tale or if that's true because uh, doctor uh, I, I assume the people the good people at Arthur the good pe- people at PBS did their due diligence and researched if Albert Einstein was asking big questions when he was three years old but I thought he wasn't able to speak until he, have you not heard that before I've heard like various kind of uh, urban legends about Albert Einstein uh, and you know, now that you mention it, it's hard to know exactly what to believe about that man's life. It, it's like, he, you know, a lot of his personal anecdotes read like those Marilyn Monroe quotes that you find on Facebook. Mm, where she's like smoking weed and has like, like, uh, uh, those tattoos that are in cursive. Yeah. It's like Photoshop pictures of Marilyn Monroe. Right. Or she's just like, oh yeah, that immortal Marilyn Manson quote, uh, ain't nothing but a G thing, baby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Marilyn Manson, Marilyn Monroe, the Minions. Really, you just slap a picture up there on the Facebook page. You put any quote under there. Absolutely. So, yeah, Arthur is delving into a very potted history of the life of Albert Einstein. Like you said, he's kind of asking questions at a young age Can't like uh, about his baby sister, or can he go faster than the speed of light on his bicycle? Which he does, and then he's, like, vaporized. He gets, like... <laughs> You know, the hammer of dawn from Gears of War from the sky because he's going so fast. Oh, is that, was that the uh, hammer of dawn? Was that that big laser? It was the big laser. That's right. You okay. would call down the hammer of dawn on the locust horns, Will. I see. Um, there was a great shot in this cold open where Einstein is in space on a light beam and he's kind of like given a thumbs up. That deserves to be on a poster. You know, you've got the <laughs> you've got Einstein making the wacky face. You've got him like on the chalkboard going, "Whoa, look at these math formulas." That one deserves to be on. A... Do, do you remember the old Pepsi campaign that had Albert Einstein in it in like the late nineties? No, it's so funny. But my childhood is filled with Einstein stuff. I, I bet Zoomers don't give a crap about Einstein. Mm. But you're right. Now that we talk about it, it's like my elementary school days are just filled with like Einstein posters. You know, that picture of him with his tongue out. I feel like everybody used to be talking about Einstein all the time, and now not so much. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say if they still have those types of posters in classrooms, but it seems that Einstein's popularity maybe has uh, weaned off a little bit as we kind of look to the future. I was going to say, I was going to compare Neil deGrasse Tyson favorably to him, but I think his popularity is rightfully slipping away. No, yeah, Einstein never tweeted, you know... Um, that Star Wars couldn't happen, right? Or done, which, which 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 puts him ahead of Neil deGrasse Tyson in my book. Uh, yeah, guys, I just watched this movie Star Wars. Turns out, in my opinion, some of this science here doesn't add up. Or or allegedly done other more inappropriate things with people. That's true. That's true. That that as well. 
so yeah, Arthur kind of giving this talk about Einstein and how he always asks questions, and DW is like, "Can we get the show started already?" Very much badgering Arthur to uh, get the show on the road, literally. Um, this uh, this so the sto- this this story is about DW, it actually gave me a, a big flashback. If you remember the importance of lining up when you were DW's age or when oh, you were yeah. in grade oh, yeah. school. big time. Hated it. Hated it. Hated oh, yeah. It. Lining up? Standing? You liked having to, like, wait for everybody to stand in line to go from class to class? That was miserable. I, that was one of my favorite things about junior high is you could just get the hell out of there. I guess it. I, I, I was kind of value neutral on it, but I tell you what, I loved being the line leader. As uh, mm. D.W. and Emily uh, f- uh, scrap over a little bit here. You know, I, some, there's there's also, you just don't want to be in the middle. Being at the end of the line is pretty good, too. You get to watch the six, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> checking the corners. Um, the whole thing is that D.W. and her class are getting ready for career day, where they are going to pick the career that they want to be. Uh, I, I, I did this in, uh, in grade one. Did you do this? I don't remember but it doesn't ring we had, we it doesn't had to dress up in everything it doesn't ring a bell honestly uh what did you dress up as oh you're gonna love this yes well. i will a uh a film director yeah how do you dress, <laughs> how do you dress up as a film director i had a beret and i made my mom made like one of those like old timey like you like a uh, i forget what it's called but like um not a gramophone like one of those yeah, cones one that of those, they would yeah the, me- the megaphones yeah yeah that's amazing! Oh my god, I'd love to see that. You dressed up as like a, a as a Cecil B. DeMille type. Exactly, exactly. At age six, no, you know what? It doesn't ring a bell to me. Although I did, you know, uh, for one, some of my younger Halloweens, I dressed as uh, like a fireman or a photographer, and those were kind of the things that I thought I wanted to be when I was very young. Uh, but not, but that was for Halloween, not for career day. Um, so DW, not sure exactly what she wants to be. Her friends, I thought this was very telling. So, of course, Emily, you know, we know her. We know her type. She wants to be a ballerina. So, all right, whatever. The, the tip- hey, look on the bright side. If this was 2020, Emily would talk about, be talking about being a hashtag girl boss. That is true. Ugh, bleh, a bows? Uh, and the Tibbles want to be either cowboys or policemen. <laughs> Or policeman, yeah. Uh, which was the tibble that was arguing for cowboy? That's now my favorite tibble. Um, okay, let me let me see if I can get this straight here. I believe so. Uh, I believe it was Timmy who was arguing okay. to be a cowboy. Okay, Tommy's on thin ice. Timmy's all right in my books. Which is too bad because Tommy is sometimes pointed out to be the good one. But you know what? Uh, yeah, we don't need. We got plenty of tibbles as cops already, if you ask me. <laughs> so they are. We we go back to the house. Arthur and DW are both going to want to watch the TV, but da- but Dad, it has a TV. He's watching a documentary about the moon landing, and this is interesting, Lucas. You and I have wondered before exactly what the age range of Mom and Dad Reed is. Th- oh, this is we vow now. This is an Arthur. Um, we don't really have a s- song for this, but this has happened before. Like when we figured out where Elwood City li- lived, where it's Arthur mystery solved. Do, 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 do. Arthur mystery solved. So, uh, Will, did you do the math? How old is the senior Reed? So check this out. Dad Reed is watching a clip of Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon, which is like the actual uh, footage of it, which is a little mm-hmm. weird. Allegedly, allegedly, Alleg- allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, so he's, was, he's watching I just the footage that, that Stanley Kubrick filmed. Of... Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, when, when I was writing down my notes, I was like, "Oh, Arthur's dad, typical boomer." He's like, uh, "Yeah, this is when they were on the moon when I was uh, when I was young." And I was like, "Allegedly, allegedly." <laughs> Arthur's dad. I have some episodes of the Joe Rogan podcast to show you. I'm just joking. I'm joking, folks. <laughs> so Plus Aldrin, don't punch me like you punched that guy outside the hotel room, please. So he says, I was Arthur's age when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. So Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, allegedly, 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 <laughs> in 1969. So that so Dad Reed would have been eight in 1969. Now, the thing about Arthur is that the characters never really age. So essentially, the, fir- the first time we met them is the age that they will stay. So we got to go all the way back to 1996 
for the first episode of Arthur. So if Dad Reed was 8 in 1969, in 1996, he would be 35. Oh, young. Yep. He's a spry individual. 35 is pretty young. Like, I'm so- how old are you, Will? I am 30 in three weeks. Yeah, I'm getting to be the age, I'm 25, and I'm getting to be the age where 35 does not, it, 30, 35 feels a lot closer to 15. <laughs> that's that's where I'm starting to be at. So yeah. to hear that, you know, I always think of, of you know, Arthur's dad, and maybe it's because I'm thinking of my own parents or something, but I always think about him to be in his late 40s, early 50s. So to hear he's 30, like I, you know, I've been at parties where there was 35 year olds, Will. Do you, do you know who else is kind of meant to be in their mid-30s? What other immortal cartoon character? Whom? Homer Simpson. Oh, I, I remember reading an article about that, about how Homer's supposed to be in his mid-30s. That's wild. <laughs> I'll have yeah. what he's having, you know what I mean? Or no, I won't have what he's having, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, lots of lots of salt and fat. Yeah, he looks like he's been taking those like Alex Jones supplements that oh, just make the, you like turn red and get all like brain brain force. Yeah, yeah, he looks like he's been eating brain force because I think Alex Jones is like super young for how f- messed. I almost swore he looks so messed up. Alex Jones age. Yeah, actually, I don't think I know this. So Alex Jones is forty six. Um, which is that 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 works, but if you look at pictures of him from like 16 years ago, he still looks insane. Huh. Or wait, that's Welsh television presenter. Wait a minute. No, I think he is 46. No, 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 no. That's the uh, that's Alex Jones, the Welsh television presenter. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh no, no, I don't know. This is this does not matter. Uh, all For, that matters I, is I okay. So I think it's 46. Anyway. Um. Yeah. So Dad's watching this documentary. And he's talking about, you know, the the moon landing and how that was important for him when he was a kid. And he happens to mention, like, you know, when uh, when you kids are my age, by that point, somebody may have gone to Mars. And DW says, nobody's gone to Mars yet? Then I've decided I'm going to be the first person to visit Mars. So that, that becomes her and career. And you know what? I thought this was cool. Yeah? Uh, like, we get that, that quick dream sequence after she proclaims that of... of um, her, you know, flying to Mars with uh, Nadine in the in the pillow fort. Yeah. And I thought, what a cool, like, I don't know, maybe this is speaking to my own biases or expectations, but I, I wouldn't expect DW to be the type to be like, I want to be the first person on Mars. And so I thought it was an interesting fit for her character, um, especially where, you know, compared to Emily and the Tibble's aspirations. Um, I just thought this whole thing was cute and like watching her like do the whole imagination sequence with all the like made up names that she's saying. Uh, I thought it was really uh, I was like, oh, like this is cool for DW. I think this is like an interesting character trait. I also will say um, yesterday I showed my roommate this video. This reminded me of this video I hadn't seen in a while. Did you ever watch the clip from the Armageddon commentary where Ben Affleck yeah. is talking about how silly the premise of Armageddon is? Yes. This, That's th- like gut bustingly funny. <laughs> he- when he's like asking, uh, oh God, he's asking Michael Bay. He's like, why not just train uh, astronauts to be oil drillers instead of oil drillers to be astronauts? Right. And Michael Bay's like, you know what? Just shut up, Ben. Just shut up. There's a great, yeah, there's a great YouTube compilation of Ben just uh, j- ripping that movie to shreds. And like, not even like setting out to. He's just kind of like saying it very casually. And it's just like, yeah, this movie's kind of stupid. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very good one. Check it out if you haven't. Um, yeah, speaking of this, there there's a sequence where DW and Nadine pretend to go to Mars. They're under, like, a bunch of couch cushions. Uh, this sequence and another one at the very end of this story reminded me of a segment in The Last of Us Part 2. I won't go into details, but if you've played it, you know what I mean. Spoilies. Spoilies. No, I'm just joking. Uh, uh, and I also loved that their little spacesuits covered their ears. I don't know why. It just made them look uh, even cuter. But in this uh, in this kind of imagination that they happen upon an alien planet is busted up by the fact that they're attacked by a giant pal uh, or a normal-sized pal who just wants to uh, wreck the pillow. 
maybe a reference to that one Twilight Zone episode where they go to that one planet where they're all big and the people are little, and then there's a big guy at the end. Oh, spo- spoilers for that episode. I haven't seen that. That's every Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> That's like the joke in Seinfeld where he's like, oh, it's the one where the guy goes to sleep. He wakes up, and he's the same, but everyone else is different. And George is like, which one was that? He's like, oh, it's all of them. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, So DW is looking to, she goes over to the Tibbles at one point who've decided they're going to be cowboy policemen, which, I mean, like, like frontier justice, you know what, that's... No, yeah, actually, that's even worse. Yeah, maybe it's, I was going to say it's kind of a push, but maybe it is even worse because there's less laws. The the Tibbles are going to be, you know, stealing ancient indigenous artifacts and giving them to passing them down to uh, grandma Thora. Oh, geez. You're right. (laughs) Right. Reference to our last episode, but the Tibbles have an idea about Mars that they proceed to scare DW with that. It's home to these like horrible dinosaur beasts that uh, try to eat anybody who comes onto the planet and uh, even try to eat each other. And I believe it's Tommy who says, you know why Mars is called the Red Planet? Because Martian blood glows in the dark. And I was like, that's pretty cool. That's like, like a lyric you... from, like, a, a, you know the band Ghost? That's like a Ghost sure. song lyric or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I, mean, I think it turns out that that's not exactly an original thought from Tommy. But at this moment, I was like, man, he's got a little bit of a, a poetic streak to him. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, I, I, I thought the uh, I love the the designs of the kind of Martian dinosaurs, like how they look like basically like your prototypical like pastel colored uh, T Rex and Velociraptor. But their eyes are on antennae. Uh, yeah, I they were cool, very creative. Yeah, I agree. Um, it looked it looked uh, you know you you hear like dinosaurs and just like ah oh, they're just gonna look like normal dinosaurs, but they did make them look a little bit more distinct than that. So I appreciated it. Uh, this kind of scares DW off the scent for a little bit. Uh, they go stargazing that night, uh, Dad, Arthur, and DW. And that's where DW kind of lets it slip to Arthur what the, what the Tibbles told her. But Arthur says, well, he, he's able to guess word for word what the Tibbles said. And it's because Buster forced him to watch a movie called Attack of the Sleepless Martian Dinosaurs. Which, great title. And, you know, there's a ton of movies that are, like, Attack of the Blank Blank. Yeah. Do you know what's something that we need to get back to is putting the word sleepless in movie titles? Okay. I, I was going to say we have nearly the exact same note. I, I want more movies with the prefix Attack of the Adjective Noun. But, okay, so <laughs> movies with sleepless in it? So, like... Yeah, it, Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, yeah, th- just describing, like... Martian dinosaurs attacking is one thing, but these guys never sleep well. They're just going to keep coming. Yeah, that is pretty horrifying. Imagine if it was Attack of the Sleepless Killer Tomatoes. Or, like, the Sleepless Terminator. Oh, my. The Sleepless. I mean, the Terminator really don't be sleeping. It's true. You just got to charge his batteries. And then even, and then you just, yeah, you think about that, or, like, uh, Sleepless Zodiac. <laughs> The Zodiac Killer, but he doesn't sleep. Okay, that's terrifying, okay. dude. Yeah, sleep. Yeah, sleepless. Last King of Scotland. Ah, <laughs> uh, I like this. This I like. The the the, the sleepless constant gardener. <laughs> the sleepless English patient. <laughs> the sleepless master and commander. <laughs> Wait, is, is the master sleepless? Is the commander sleepless, or are they both sleepless? Get this, will. Master and the Commander, he's the same person. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> Almost swore. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, we also... We also I'm g- sorry. I just haven't thought about Master and Commander in a really long time. <laughs> um, we get something that's equally out of left field, and that's the fact that this episode of Arthur mentions not just H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, but the Orson Welles hoax, like the, that. The, this whole little p- bit is probably like the most Wikipedia e Arthur has ever sounded. What do you mean? Like when 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 Dad reads like, yeah, H. D. Wells wrote this book, War of the Worlds, and D. W. like, is it real? And he's like, no, but people thought it was real in the infamous uh, Orson Welles uh, broadcast. And I'm like, it just it's so like, 
I, I've heard this. Fa- First of all, is this true? Has this been disproved? I think that it has been like it's. I, I thought tales of people thinking it was real was like greatly exaggerated. I think it is, and I, I think that now it's become such shorthand that everybody knows that it didn't exactly happen like that. Yeah. So I think you're right in the sense of of like it wasn't quite as dra- like people weren't like running out into the streets and screaming or something, but there was like mild confusion. This is what I think. Uh, ended up being kind of, yeah. So like, I I used Snopes earlier to try and figure out uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, so Snopes says that that story is mostly false. Okay, I I would love it if like you know we're just kind of going through just kind of like uh, word association facts with D W right. So his dad's like, yeah, there's this book called War of the Worlds, and then also did you hear about this thing with with uh, Orson Welles reading this radio play? And he's like, also did you know that famous actor Orson Welles' last performance in a film was in the 1984 animated <laughs> Transformers movie where he played Unicron? And he's like, Unicron was a living planet. That you know he just keeps going with it. Right, it's just it, it's just a non it's just a nonstop lack of filter for random facts. Um, but yeah, I was just really surprised that they even mentioned that. It's it's it just seems like kids need to understand first what War of the Worlds is and what radio plays were, and then when they're a bit older, they can understand what happened. But I mean, I I guess I appreciate them doing it. It's just again didn't didn't expect that to be uh, to be mentioned. Um, there's also, there's a part where they do like a little imagination sequence where it's like the people reacting, uh, with fear to the radio broadcast. And I just noted that the, wo- there's like a man, a woman, they run outside and start screaming, but the woman screamed really strangely. It's like the, the voice actor who was screaming for her, like, didn't want to wake the neighbors. So it was like. <laughs> Oh, it was like, oh, no, yeah. like the, the the aliens are attacking. And then she's like, oh, the aliens are attacking. <sighs> like, yeah, it's, really... like, it's like when like 14 year olds record like metalcore covers in their bedrooms, <laughs> but they don't want their mom to know. You, you, ever, you ever see that? Uh, you ever see that video of um, uh, of that Mudvayne song? But it's it's just the opening. It's just the guy going. Ah. <laughs> No, I have. You have to link that too. I will. <laughs> Mudvayne is one of my prime examples in my theory that every new metal band in the early two thousands had to have a clown guy in it. Yes, I think that's. I think that's definitely worth following, uh, especially because one of the most popular ones, uh, uh, Limp Biscuit, had one too. That's right, clown guy, Limp Biscuit, Slipknot, all clown guys. Uh, man, I hope I can find that Mudvayne video. Uh, said is me and nobody else. Um. So to help to debunk the myths that DW has been told about um, Mars, Dad decides to take her to the local Elwood City Science Museum. And they kind of go to different exhibits. DW gets to go into the little rover. Uh, again, Last of Us Part Two. if you know, you know. Uh, she gets a little model of Mars. Hey, by the way, did you notice um, Mr. Morris as the janitor here? Oh my god, no, I did not notice that. So he must be, like, contract... I see him now, I'm rewatching the episode as we talk. So he must be contracted out, like... Usually, I, I maybe I just don't understand how janitorial work works at, at elementary schools, but I was to believe that my elementary school janitor, that was his full-time job. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he. Maybe it's just something he uh, does on the weekend, or... Uh, or wait, but, did he move back? Did well, he yeah, move he, to, like, Texas? That's the thing, he moved away, so, like... Maybe was that a cover? Like, is he? Did he come back? I don't know. Brother, Pro- probably most likely they just wanted to use his character model, or you could just as easily say this happened before all of that. So you know, reflexive timeline. Uh, so DW does present on being an astronaut and going to Mars for Career Day. At first, the kids are super scared because the by the way, are... so, some of these background kids I'm looking through now. It's it's unclear what job some of these kids are supposed to be doing. Like, right? What is that kid with the glasses that uh, DW's friend? I forget his name. Oh, um, um, uh, not George, but uh, uh, Molly's little brother. Yeah, yeah, James, James, James. Like, what is James supposed to be? He looks like an old timey train conductor. Oh, M- maybe, maybe. I was like, he just looks like he's just wearing the brand Golf from head to toe. <laughs> Uh, that would be my guess, or like, I don't know, artists of some kind? 
Good question. And then who the guy with the clock? The guy with the clock. There is. Let me see if I can find the time code for you. There's a kid who's just got like a clock around his neck, like he's Flava Flav. I was gonna say, is he gonna be rap hype man? Yeah, I mean, all all things considered, not a bad career choice. Yeah, boy, and all that. But yeah, I can't find this clock guy. We're moving on. But right. <laughs> I, I let's just think he's yeah. I, ladies and gentlemen of my preschool class, I'm here to announce that in the future, I would like to be on an MTV2 dating reality show. That's what I would like to be when I grow up. Absolutely. In the, um, in the spirit of, oh, what was that Flavor of Flav song called? Flavor, so of, called? Flavor of Love? Flavor of Love. Thank you. Thank you. I watched uh, far too much of that uh, yeah, when I was young. Poops on the Floor. That's a crazy episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, DW, uh, the Tibbles kind of get into everybody's heads about the, you know, the myths about the aliens on Mars, but DW uh, brings up the straight facts and knows her stuff and... Uh, the Tibbles are so impressed that they also want to become astronauts and cowboys and policemen. But DW is very proud of herself. So yeah, kind of kind of wraps up with some some like real educational like educational uh, content in your Arthur episode, which we don't always get up get straight educational content, but it is there if you look for it. All right, so we're going to briefly take just a quick aside here, and then we're going to come back with the second Arthur story of this episode. This podcast is supported by listeners like you, and here's how. Over on our social networks, you can follow us and find the latest updates and some fun photos. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits, at ECL Podcast on Twitter, ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com, and Elwood City Limits on Instagram. You can support us monetarily by going over to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. If you become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, you get access to exclusive audio content like our new PBS Kids show, movie reviews, and sneak previews of upcoming content. Support us as well by going to teespring.com slash stores slash Elwood dash city dash limits dash store or search Elwood City Limits on Teespring. Buy yourself a t-shirt, a tank top, or a hoodie with the Elwood City Limits logo or an exclusive design by our friend Josh. Elwood City Limits is available online at libsyn.com slash Elwood City Limits where you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast apps. Is it not on your favorite app? Let us know. And you can always help us by spreading the word, tell your friends, and send Send us a message either on social media or an email, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your continued support. And now, let's get back to the show. So, Lucas, you you didn't believe me when I said this was the title of the episode, at least initially, but it is Flaw and Order. Yeah, my, my goodness. I was excited for this one. And my excitement only grew when I saw this opening. This... I, the actually the excitement actually turned to disappointment pretty quickly because I thought the whole episode was going to be like this opening sequence for a second. Oh, and I no. was like, oh my goodness gracious. This kind of, you know, knives out, murder on the Orient Express, Agatha Christie, uh, uh, bunch of clue, you know, bunch of people in an old house and three three piece, you know, triple breasted suits accusing each other of uh, 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 murder. Like, I was, like, so into this. Well, I am sorry to disappoint you. Although, I mean, I I wasn't disappointed personally with where it went. But, yeah, you know, this kind of reminded me. I was trying to catch the exact nature of what this opening scene is. It's essentially a parlor scene from, like, a classic detective novel, like you kind of said. It didn't so much strike me as, like, Sherlock or, like, Agatha Christie. It struck me as the episode's of TNG where they play detective in the holodeck. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. It's something about the modern characters being put into like, um, throwback dress that I was Second like, Second episode of the row. We've talked about TNG. Those are some of the best episodes of TNG. By the I way. love those episodes. Data and Picard yucking it up on the holodeck. Yeah. Uh, Data and Jordy, uh, duking it out with Moriarty. I love those episodes. Uh, so Remember when he gets off the holodeck, yeah, He's walking oh my around, God. that's crazy. You should be allowed to have if that's a possibility. You know, you should be allowed to have one of those on the ship. I'm pretty sure. I think we need some more holodeck regulation if the guy could get off. It is pretty unprecedented, and it does make for a hell of a story. So I will allow it. 
Uh, so they're doing the parlor scene. There's like there's Arthur Buster. Uh, Brain is the scientist. Binky is like I forget. Oh, I should have written down what Arthur calls him. Uh, Binky is like at the in a smoking jacket at the piano. Muffy is the heiress, and they're all privy to a crime. Uh, it's kind of a yeah general mystery story parody, and the lights go out, and uh, of course they don't exactly solve who did it in that opening. So yeah, unfortunately we don't continue with this aesthetic, but I don't know. Uh, let's let's continue on here. Um, there is a mystery set up immediately at the beginning. We see Arthur and Buster playing uh, playing catch outside, and then a a decorative cake plate uh, falls over in the Reed living room and takes a chip out of it, which is very important because dad needs it for a wedding. He's going to cater and it needs to be that exact cake plate. And now it's been, um, had a chunk taken out of it essentially. Now, Arthur admits that he, he says that he and Buster were outside playing catch, but DW was secretly filming them on what she calls her spy camera. It's really just a camcorder. Which and then uh, Arthur's like, "Where did you get that?" And Buster's like, "I let DW borrow it while we were here." And Which, Buster, yeah. tape's expensive, man. Yeah, really, especially back then. Um, so DW took a video of Arthur and Buster. First of all, before we get to the incriminating evidence, she took video of Arthur and Buster playing a DDR knockoff. Right, but it looks really like. It's like this weird, like almost like square dancing DDR knockoff. Like if you watch Arthur and Buster, they're not using it like how people use DDR, where you kind of like stand with your feet planted in the middle and like step to the side, step to the side. They're like walking around them in like circles. Yeah. It and and the and the interface is not like arrows on the screen. It's like they're kind of putting, you know, lights into different lights. Yeah. It's it's interesting, but I was like, oh yeah, DDR mats, man. Wish I had a yeah, DDR. Yeah. Wish and, I had a DDR mat. We can't really make up the music, but it doesn't sound like you know, Love Shine Hero, Love or, Shine, or or Cartoon Heroes, or, or Butterfly, boom, boom Boom Dollar. Yeah, or Captain you know, Jack. Hit. Oh my God, Captain Jack! Incredible song. I uh, I do I do somewhat rep- resent the fact that G- like DW takes this video and she later on she's like you boys dance divinely and like making fun of them so it's like I resent the implication that DDR dancing isn't for boys DDR is awesome no it's matter true. it's true no no well, matter who you are they had it at my elementary school at, at gym class sometimes no way that's amazing mm-hmm, 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 oh I'm mm-hmm. so jealous of you I had a friend who had a DDR mat and I remember once I was playing at her house and I. You know, did did the big jump to do the you know if you're gonna do up and up and back or left and right? I did the big jump and totally like collapsed my head into the roof. Oh my god! It was a very low hanging ceiling, and I just totally like had had to like stagger myself and like like I was okay. I've got a I've got a big round thick head, but I <laughs> it was uh, it really I I lost the rest of the song as you could probably guess. <laughs> Recovering. Oh, yeah, I miss DDR. I miss rhythm games. Um, So she also captures uh, footage of them playing catch indoors, which Arthur didn't cop to earlier. And what we what what we we don't see them throw the ball and it go, uh, you know, it shatter the the um, what is it called? The cake plate. But we we hear Arthur say Buster catch, then a sound and then the cake plate shattering. So the implication, the heavy implication, is that Arthur and Buster broke it. But Arthur it vehemently denies this. He admits that he kept it from them, that they were playing inside. But he did not break the cake plate. And now he has to figure out exactly... He has until that evening when Dad says, you have to tell me exactly what happened. And he has until that evening to prove his innocence. Yeah, we got a mystery afoot, Will. And we get the title card, Binky's House. 11.50 a.m. <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about this. Yeah. So, the Law & Order Jun Jun noise, okay? Legendary. Iconic. I remember reading an article the other day that it's like 12 things playing at the same time. It's like a very yeah. complicated noise. As, ma- as many iconic sounds tend to be. Re- this Jun Jun doesn't really cut it, I'm going to say. Well... 
I agree. Well, I, there's a narrative reason for yeah. because they use it later on in the episode, like in the narrative. Yeah. But also, I feel like because of that, they also use it too much. Like it, it's it's. I was delighted when I saw the title card at first. I was like, oh my gosh, we're doing a lot order parody. I hope one of the Arthur characters starts talking like Ice-T. It is like, put you in orange jumpsuit, send you off the Rikers. I remember this from Nine Attics. I, thought, I, hope, I, was, I was waiting for that to happen. Um, but I, I will say that it did kind of get on my nerves a little bit. Oh. See the, see, the sound itself didn't exactly do that for me just because of the fact that... Um, well, along with, you know, unlike Law and Order, we have Buster reading what's happening on screen, which I think is probably important so that uh, viewers who are perhaps visually impaired are able to understand the titles because they're very oh. sparse. And that was that was my thinking of why they would do it that way. Um, so they do read it out. And so it was Buster's voice distracted me enough from realizing, you know, I didn't really you know, like the sound much either. So <laughs> they go over to Binky's place and Binky is kind of like, I wasn't anywhere near this. And so I, I, th- I think the, I think they even say as much that like, well, the first person we interview has to have nothing to do with it. That's or funny. S- and, and yeah, Binky's like the standee for like the guy who's like loading something onto a truck while talking to the cops. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, so I thought that was very funny, and there were a lot of fun ways that they could be um, that they could be kind of genre savvy about this in a cute way. So yeah, Binky had nothing to do with this; he was nowhere near the near the scene of the crime. So they do ask for Fern's help, which thank God. I mean, I, I initially I thought this would be a Fern episode, but she's at least a featured character. So I mean, that's 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 all well and good. Um, so Fern turns them to Sherlock Holmes and she kind of dispenses wisdom from him to figure out how to solve the case. Um, there is a point here when, you know, Arthur's appealing his case to mom and she's like, well, I certainly hope you have enough evidence. And to me, it was a little bit of a leap that, um, that mom and dad wouldn't trust Arthur if he was denying it this, this voraciously. Oh, now, really? I, See, I, I was thinking the other way where it's like, if this was happening to me, my mom would never be like, I certainly hope you have enough evidence. She would simply go, stop lying. <laughs> right. Uh, would... My parents would never give me the chance to, like, prove my innocence. Um, and Arthur did lie earlier. He did screw himself with that. Yes, so that, He's that is something. He's lie before. Remember what he stole? Oh, yeah, that's, that is true. And, and, yeah, I know not to say that kids are incapable of lying. Even Arthur is capable of lying. We know this. But it just seemed a little bit like... This is, you know, this is pretty serious that you're accusing him of. And he seems to be like, I like, he seems to be very, very much like I can prove I didn't do this, which at, at this point, if you're a kid and you're saying to me, I can prove I didn't do this. And I'm like, OK, all right. Well, well, let me see. Let me see then. I don't know. It just see, it seemed a little strange to me, but I, I understand it. It was obviously uh, needed for the story to be the way it is. Um what I did like was they go to Brain's place and he is like the scientist of yeah. you know, the crime he's, he's like lab the, scientist. The, the goth girl from NCIS. <laughs> yeah. And he he is actually very helpful because he um, he is Puts the, the sound one... in audacity. <laughs> <laughs> or, or it's like, what what DAW do you think he's using here? Like, is Braid, like, playing this back in Ableton, Fruity Loops? <laughs> uh, that's a little bit outside my expertise, unfortunately. But it was it was funny because Brain does uh, get audio from the camera to be like, well, uh, uh, you see, there is another sound that's being played besides the glass breaking. And if you can find out what that sound is then you can figure out exactly what broke that uh, cake plate. He also says that the break of the cake plate uh, is not would not come from a baseball like they were throwing around. It would come from a... Does he t- determine it's like a stone, or does he just say a different... Uh, yeah, something like stone-like or consistency. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was great. I thought he was very well used in this episode. Uh, they also uh, find a watch from which they determine belongs to a local businesswoman named Mrs. Persky. Which is who they got the plate from. That's right. Arthur's dad is talking about Mrs. Persky. Now, it's funny, this is my poor memory talking. 
I was confusing initially when they were talking about a Mrs. Persky. I was thinking of who do they get Pal from? Oh, um, uh, Mrs. Wood. Oh, okay, Mrs. Wood. Okay, I th- I thought there was another like n- well, older a... woman whose name ends with Ski. Well, there's the Ar- Ms. there's Mrs. Fink. Mrs. Fink. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know who you might be thinking of. Maybe okay. Well, Mrs. Persky. Another. I'm not going to give uh, Mrs. Persky the dignity of the throwaway character of the week. Oh. Because and I'll talk to you about this a little. Actually, no. We're getting to Mrs. Persky's introduction right now. Uh, Mrs. Persky. Her voice doesn't fit the way she looks. Like she said, it's just Grandma Thora's voice. No. Do you, well, do you know who that voice is? No. So it's the voice actor for the narrator of Caillou. Oh. Like I totally, it took me a second to figure it out, but I'm like, oh yeah, that's Caillou's grandmother. That's the the woman who narrates all the Caillou shorts. My goodness. Well, it sounds like an older woman, and Mrs. Like Persky just doesn't look like that. And also, she's just kind of a bunny. Like her character design's not that memorable. Right. Um, they could have done something fun with this, but but you uh, but you don't feel they did. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, yeah, so they do go to Mrs. Persky, who owns, like, a local, I think it's, a key, like, a key shop. Like, she cuts keys. Well, and, and she's, well, she's got all that glassware. Glassware, that's it. So, they, the watch that they found in their living room is broken for some reason. And Mrs. Persky says, that, you know, when she was leaving, she, um, she, like, had her watch hand out the window, and her watch slipped off, and it kind of got broken in the street. To some or or that to some effect, and unfortunately, they don't have quite enough to put together exactly what happened. Uh, it's at this point we get Fern saying, you know, the classic Sherlock Holmes ism that if you like, if you, um, oh, I'm gonna mess, I'm gonna mess up this wording, but it's like if you, you know, reach every conclusion that whatever's left over, however impossible it may seem, is what happened, and that is where they kind of create the timeline of what happened because they found Mrs. Persky's watch next on the couch next to where the, uh, next to where the cake plate was broken. And then they hear the sound as they're going in to the, as they're going into the Reed home and it's the cars in the street traveling over the sewer grate, which is kind of like, uh, going up and down as they drive over them. And in fact, to the point where Buster gets hit in the arm with a pebble that was on the sewer grate. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, the Zapruder film back into the left, the magic <laughs> boulder. Uh, so they have finally have enough to put together their case, and they even have their own parlor scene uh, where they invite the friends that have been that have been kind of involved thus far. And Arthur says, "Thank you all for coming." DW says, "What are you talking about? I'm here all the time." <laughs> Immediately, yeah, undercutting. great line from DW. Uh, so Arthur presents his evi- presents his evidence and the conclusion that what happened was the watch got onto the sewer grate, and a car going by caused it to uh, be travel with such force into the open window where the cake plate was, causing it to fall on the floor and shatter. And that's uh, that's enough for everybody, and I mean it is. It, I mean it pretty much is what happened. There's no mystery to it. Brain even provides like a very rudimentary diagram of what happened, which I thought was kind oh, of funny. And then the kicker is Mrs. Persky comes out, uh, and she talks about how she couldn't uh, stand to not have like a dramatic entrance. I thought that was kind of cute. She's yeah, just like, I thought oh, that I was love, cute as well. I love a good mystery, and I really just wanted to wait in the wings, and so she uh, even repaired. Uh, the cake plate for free because, uh, well, she, she heard everything and, Arthur uh, found her watch. Yeah. So, uh, so all seems to be well, but this, the last like 10 seconds, I didn't see coming where it's like, all right, great. Now we, everything's back to normal and Arthur's cleared and we can go about our day. And then they still have the cake plate in the same window. And then they hear the sound of a car going over the grate and a pebble slowly makes its way towards the cake plate and everybody goes, Oh no. And we cut to black. (laughs) Yeah. It's like the end of inception (laughs) or the end of the Sopranos. Even if they were just playing journey. Yeah. Don't stop. Believe it. Exactly. Yeah. The end of this episode's from the cake plates perspective. (laughs) 
it kind of is. I mean, and it, it, it's it's just such an unusual. I'm so not used to a cliffhanger ending in an episode of Arthur, and it really was like, wow, we're not gonna get resolution to that. Okay, like it. I wasn't I wasn't mad at it or anything, but. Uh, it's just really interesting that they decided to do that. So yeah, let's talk about um, let's talk about that episode now. Uh, let's, I, in fact, let's go back to DW Ames High. Uh, Lucas, what did you think of that one? So DW Ames, Ames High is interesting. I, I really like I like the idea of DW really wanting to become an astronaut. I feel like a lot of times when DW has like aspirations, they're very fanciful to the extent that they're like almost annoying. Like she wants to be like uh, a magical, uh, some sort of uh, thing that we know for a fact that DW can never be. And, and DW probably won't ever be an astronaut that goes to Mars either. But there was something about like DW getting so interested in the science. Um, we don't usually see DW be kind of studious. You know, there's been episodes upon episodes where DW is making up fake facts or she kind of like, much to comedic purposes, like very loosely understands like how everything in the world works. Yeah. Um, so this was like really interesting because it almost felt like kind of growth from DW um, to see her be so kind of morbidly curious and fascinated by space. Uh, I thought that was kind of cute. That being said, um, there isn't really much of an arc to the episode. Like it, it's mostly an episode about, Hey, if you're interested in something, you should just research it. Um, yeah. There's not a lot of like conflict or, or or what have you, and it does get very like Wikipedia e, um, for better or for worse. I mean, that's actually kind of it, it, it's it's nice for kids because I'm sure I know that everybody freaked out because Orson or supposedly everyone freaked out because Orson Welles read the radio play or whatever. But uh, I'm sure kids have never heard that before, so it's important for them to learn. That being said, whenever Arthur gets kind of that way where it's just very much telling you factual information, it doesn't quite feel like Arthur to me. I feel like Arthur's usually a little bit more less blunt with conveying um, either educational material by showing us like a dream sequence or something or or... It's just a little bit less like reading from a Wikipedia article. Uh, that being said, so uh, this is taking all of this into consideration. I think it's just a, a fine episode. I don't think it's exceptional. You know, it's probably not one I'm going to go back to, but it did make me feel good. And I liked seeing DW kind of in this role. It is kind of strange. Now that you mention it, you're right. It's not often that Arthur gets very in your face educational. And when it when it does, it's usually about like, kind of social, more social issues or, like, you know, behavioral type stuff. It's not, like, straight-up facts about, like, Mars. This seemed more like, you know, you get these kind of fact dumps in, like, the magic school bus or something. But it didn't seem so much as appropriate for Arthur. Not that I minded it by any by any stretch. In fact, I kind of liked it. I liked the idea of career day and seeing DW kind of uh, think bigger about her place in the world. But uh, and and there and there were it, there were kind of cute parts to it, but it didn't do a whole lot for me, you know, as an episode. I thought it was I I'm with you. I also kind of came away with like yeah, that was fine. Uh, it but it didn't do much for me other than that, other than just being like fairly pleasant. I will say though, I feel a lot more strongly about flaw and order. I actually really liked this. I ended up getting into it because at the at the beginning, the the idea is is that you know that Arthur's innocent. But you're not. You're also not at all confident about what happened. So I am, like from the from the beginning, I was curious of like, how are they going to resolve this? And so I, they hooked me. By God, I was hooked. And uh, it moves along at a pretty good clip. They, I think they did a pretty good job of kind of uh, poking fun at the tropes of Law and Order. And I thought they did a pretty good job of that without you know getting too uh, meta or self referential. And I, I thought I thought the uh, the um, conclusion of the mystery itself was also pretty appropriate. Like it wasn't, you know, it was a little far fetched, but it wasn't like oh, you know, aliens did it or something. So I thought that uh, the whole thing came together really well, and I just thought that this was a really uh, one of the better episodes of the season that I've seen personally. It even had a like a cliffhanger ending, which. I wouldn't say is for it or against it, but I was like, wow, again, didn't see that one coming. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think Flawed Order was, like, really interesting for a couple of reasons. I love the opening dream sequence. 
Um, I love it when they change the format. So like the te- text cards and kind of mirroring a law and order episode, that was really fun, though the sound did kind of get annoying. We forgot to explain, by the way, that the sound is the, the, the actual sound they use for the watch itself. And that's why they keep playing it at, uh, because it's, it, you hear the actual like seed transition noise when Braid is, is playing back on his, you know, his Adobe audition or whatever. That's right. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was an interesting episode. I think it, Arthur mystery episodes, the problem that you always are worried about is that because it's intended for kids, you're going to put the mystery together before you get to the end of the episode. And so it kind of takes all the, the tension of it. And this episode didn't fall into that trap. I truly did not know where it was going or how I, I for a second there, I thought Arthur was lying. Um, so really? Wow. Yeah. I thought he was like an unreliable narrator for a moment. Cause I was like, well, mm. how they had me. I was like, how else is this going to break? Um, I thought DW was funny in her role of just like good DW quips in this episode. Um, I don't really like, I think that it was a, it was a missed opportunity uh, with uh, Mrs. Mrs. Oh gosh, my memory's getting, I got to take my fish oil pills, man. It's a PEI sat my memory. Mrs. Uh, Persky. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Persky. I, uh, I don't really like, I, I think Mr. Persky was kind of uninteresting. I think they could have had more fun with whoever was going to be the guest character or what have you in this episode. But that being said, yeah, seeing all the Arthur characters kind of put into new roles as extras in a Law & Order episode was a blast. So, uh, you know, Binky being the, the guy who's just kind of at his job that's like, I don't know nothing about that. And then, like, Fern kind of being, like, an expert that they go to seek advice from. And then, of course, Brain being kind of the science guy stand-in. That was all really fun. And there's a big, good rising action. And then, of course, like, it comes to the climax, which is very much like the parlor scene at the end. Um, and like you said, I love... One of my favorite Arthur endings of all time is the Lice episode because it just ends with an on-screen death. Uh, and it's just so <laughs> morbid and dark compared to regular Arthur episode endings. And I love this one too where the implication is that all is still lost and the plate's going to break anyway. Uh, some or, maybe, or, episodes... maybe, or maybe it won't. So that was, that was really fun as well. Because some Law & Order episodes do have downer endings. So... Oh you know. yeah, there's that one that was going around on Twitter a couple weeks ago where the guy just like shoots the kid. Yes, or the one I where remember Justin that. Bieber gets shot. There's that one too. Yeah, that might. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, you know what, Lucas? Um, now that I think about it, there's something really quickly I wanted to talk to you about, and it doesn't have to do with this episode. We're kind of uh, wrapping it up here. Have you been following any of the? extra the kind of extra content that's being put out on the arthur social media channels we've been putting it on elwood city limits but i'm referring to the fact that recently um there have been a couple of videos that the arthur team have worked on specifically to talk about covid19 the graduating I saw class these of with the with the zoom calls yeah this the, was really cute the graduating class of 2020 and most recently this week there was one about racism where arthur buster and mrs mcgrady had a video talking about what kids can do about racism. Yeah, and I thought it was great. I agree. I, I, I really wanted to bring that up quickly because we, um, it's been happening for the last couple of months and we've I've kind of neglected to talk about it, but I don't have much other to add to it other than all three of those videos were really good and hopeful and broke down, especially with the uh, coronavirus and the, uh, um, and the racism one really broke down something complex for kids to understand. So I'm glad that they like, it's one of those moments where I'm like, man, I'm glad we're talking about this show where it's like, it, it's not like another show. I don't even, I'm not even thinking of anything particular, but like, it's not like, Oh, you know, Arthur is coming down and just like, you know, being anti mask or something. No, it's like continually Arthur seems to be on the right side of history. So it made me very proud. That, that would be really crazy. If Arthur was an anti mask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just, or, or just like the, there have been opportunities for Arthur to be like, even back in the 90s, to be, like, weird about an issue, but it never really has been. So it made me really happy that we chose to kind of cover a show that seems to be on the right side of history for the most part in a lot of things. So I'm glad I'm glad that you got to see those, and I'm glad that we both kind of agree on that. All right, Lucas, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up here. Uh, we I, I want to say, again, I, I kind of mentioned this at the top when we did the acknowledgments and the emails. Lucas, we've got a bunch of new patrons over at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits, who are excited to hear more episodes of For the Kids. And we would just, again, want to give them a big thank you for joining up uh, with us on our Patreon adventure. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's been great to see uh, more people hopping on the Patreon, you know, talking in the Discord, all that jazz. So we do have another episode of For the Kids coming up soon. And it is it was your pick this time. What did you decide to pick? Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah, that one is going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of research, but I'm going to do Mr. Rogers Proud. So if that sounds good to you, and if you want to check out the other episodes of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, uh, you can join our Patreon. Just check it out, and uh, you can find out a lot of audio content. There's going to be also a bit of a, a bit of a surprisement coming up in the Patreon feed. I'm going to be making a post over there for all of our patrons very soon as to what you can expect coming up into next week. Because Lucas, by the time our listeners hear from us on the main feed again, it's going to be our fourth birthday. Oh my gosh. Four years. Four years. Just when Albert Einstein learned to talk. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so, I mean, we'll we'll get into all of that at at a later time, but that's what we're gearing up for, our fourth anniversary here at Elwood City Limits. So the next time you hear from us uh, talking about an episode of Arthur... Well, we're going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a little bit of a baseball theme as we're talking about the curse of the Greebs. And then we're also talking about Arthur changes gears. So I'm excited to learn more potentially about the Elwood City Greebs. I actually have a t-shirt of theirs. Oh my goodness. So mu- much to look forward to here, to here in the month of August. Uh, not only is my birthday coming up, not only is Arthur Holden's birthday coming up, the voice of Mr. Ratburn, but a lot of fun stuff. Whether you are a patron of Elwood City Limits or if you are listening to us for free, which either one is completely valid. So, uh, yeah, keep it, keep uh, hanging on there and uh, keep enjoying the rest of your summer before we uh, hit a stage two with this uh, coronavirus business. All right, so I will say goodbye. My name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini... All I'm saying is a rocket-powered baseball bat would be cool. We will see you next time.